Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to um, the final session of the Law and Justice Forum on Rogue States. Um, my name is John Nilsson Wright. I um, am based at Cambridge University. I'm a diplomatic historian by training. I work on the politics and international relations also of Northeast Asia, with a particular focus on Japan and the two Koreas. So in the context of today's discussion of rogue states, um, I obviously take a, a particular keen interest in the question of the DPRK and how we should see it, whether in fact it's a rogue actor or not. Um, certainly in terms of its impact on regional diplomacy and global security, many people would argue that the DPRK is certainly uh, an unpredictable uh, and certainly a disruptive state in terms of uh, the politics and dynamics of the region and further afield. Uh, I am not a legal, legal specialist, um, so I am very much looking forward to this session and the opportunity to learn a lot from uh, the panelists. Um, I realize that some of you have been here all day, but for those of you who are new, perhaps it would be appropriate for me to begin with um, an introduction of the panelists. Um, to the immediate, to the far right of me at the end of the panel is the Honorable Michael Kirby, former Justice of the High Court of Australia, uh, Chair of the UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights and DPRK. Um, uh, Justice Kirby has had a string of very prominent legal appointments in his distinguished career. Uh, from 1996, he served for 13 years on the High Court of Australia. Uh, was the acting Chief Justice of Australia uh, on no fewer than two occasions, and very importantly in terms of our discussions today, was the Chairman of the UN, of the UN Human Rights Commission. Um, to his left uh, is a fellow member of uh, that same commission, Sonia Biserko, um, who is the founder and president of the Helsinki Committee for Human Rights in Serbia. She has written extensively on the former Yugoslavian conflict, uh, the issue of war crimes, the trials of um, a number of actors in that tragic history, including Slobodan Milosevic and various others, uh, the founder member of the European Movement in Yugoslavia, uh, and the Centre for Anti-War Action in the Belgrade Forum for International Relations. Um, to my immediate left is Professor Richard Miller of Cornell University, a professor in the Department of Philosophy at that university and also the director of the program on ethics and public life. Uh, professor Miller is a specialist in social and political philosophy. Among the many books he has authored, um, a number of them are particularly relevant to our discussions today, including from 1992, Moral Differences, Truth, Justice and Conscience in a World of Conflict. And then more recently in 2016, Equality, Democracy, and National Sovereignty. Um, reconnecting East and West, I believe. Reconciling East and West, um, which was also published in Chinese. Um, and then last but not least, um, Dr. Gina Heathcote, um, a scholar at the School of Oriental and African Studies here in London, uh, the author of Law, uh, on the, Law on the Use of Force, a Feminist Analysis, Dr. Heathcote focuses her research on collective security, uh, the political and legal aspects of the use of force, and the relationship between law, gender, and violence. So we have a very distinguished panel um, to engage with a topic that I think is extraordinarily broad. Um, I thought I might begin by just making a few observations, um, because it seems to me that looking out on the landscape of international relations today, there have been a number of critical changes that have challenged some of the assumptions that have underpinned what many people have referred to as the international order that emerged in the aftermath of the Second World War. Um, the first and perhaps most obvious challenge to that international order is the changing role of the United States under President Donald Trump. To paraphrase um, the writing of Stephen Ambrose, the United States has retreated from its traditional global role uh, and has arguably, under Donald Trump, adopted a very different approach to international politics, no longer playing the role of a critical international hegemon, if you like, the guarantor of last resort when it comes to international order. But we've seen with Donald Trump a much more transactional approach to international relations, one in which has led many people to question whether, in fact, the United States is, in fact, as Joseph Nye once said, bound to lead 
to what extent is Donald Trump creating an international environment in which the traditional stabilizing role of the United States has been challenged. And that's particularly important, I think, in terms of understanding the role of actors that are traditionally closely aligned with the United States, uh, particularly alliance countries such as Japan and South Korea, something which I'm sure we'll come back to in the discussions. But the second, perhaps critical, pillar of the post-war international order, certainly from the vantage point of security specialists, is the critical role of nuclear deterrence. The American Cold War historian John Lewis Gaddis in a book entitled The Long Peace, once argued, of course, that it was nuclear deterrence that kept the peace for the best part of 50 plus years. Certainly peace between the principal major actors in that Cold War conflict. Of course, for the smaller states, it was anything but a long peace. It was brutal, it was bloody, it was a conflict that cost the lives of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, vulnerable citizens across the globe in some of those key regional conflicts. But there's no doubt that the emergence of new nuclear actors, and again I emphasize here an issue that's close to my heart, North Korea in particular, has led many states uh, in the region, particularly in Northeast Asia, to question the reliability of extended deterrence and the nuclear umbrella that the United States has provided to some of those key American allies. And in the process, raising really legitimate and important questions about regional stability. The third pillar of the post-war international order, arguably, was the, the role of liberal democratic values. And of course, it was Francis Fukuyama back in 1989 who talked confidently about the end of history and the triumph of democratic values. Of course, that confident assumption now looks somewhat hollow. Um, the reaction to the forces of globalization has led, some would say ineluctably, to the rise of populist politics. Populist politics that is not only anti-elitist, but also inherently anti-pluralist, um, and creating in turn an appetite for new forms of authoritarian government in ways that have raised real questions about the nature of states and the interaction between those states. Whether it's in Hungary or in Poland or in Southeast Asia in the form of the government of the Philippines, um, or even internally within states that once seemed quite confident in their embrace of liberal democratic values. I'm thinking of the role of the Front National in France under Le Pen, or of course, very obviously, the emergence of a new style of politics of intolerance in the United States. And of course, today, the day after the Russian election, the role of um, Russia under Putin. Um, and to what extent have those liberal democratic values been challenged as a result of new structural forces that are creating a new style of politics. So we are operating in an environment where there's a great deal of change, a great deal of uncertainty. And in that context, I'd like to begin by asking the panelists to talk briefly, if they may, um, about some of the key questions that relate to our topic today. Beginning with a, a very simple question, but one that I imagine will divide the panel and will be difficult to answer. Who are the rogue states? Um, Justice Kirby, can I ask you to kick off with a few thoughts on how you would define rogue states, if that's possible at all? Well, um, the misfortune of our chair coming at the end of the day is that the chair wasn't present during the um, uh, debate, and I think it's fair to say that none of the panellists were very impressed with the notion of rogue states. Uh, first, because uh, it's a kind of uh, prejudgment uh, before you've actually defined what a rogue state is and before uh, you've had a discussion and before you've heard what they say about being categorised in that fashion. Uh, and um, uh, secondly, uh, that in international law and international practice to some extent, there is no um, consequence of being so classified um, and thirdly, that it's fundamentally a categorization of the United States government and it's very rare that you see it used by others. Um, and therefore, it really was a bit of a non-issue, if I can say so, in our panel, at least from my perspective, because we, we didn't like having this handed to us by a, a few successive... United States administrations has no footing 
in international law and in the Korean context, which we were brought here to London to discuss, uh, it was never used by the Commission of Inquiry, never used in its report, never used by the members of it in discussing North Korea, and indeed it would be um, inconsistent with the mandate that they held to use that expression. So uh, at the end of our day, I think uh, the um, explanations given at the beginning by Professor Miller really hit the idea of rogue states on the head. If it had a consequence, if a category of rogue state was known to international law or international practice, and if that led on to some um, retaliation, some uh, United Nations action, some designation by the Security Council that uh, removed them from the United Nations, well, it would be a different matter, but there's, it doesn't have any of those consequences, and so it's a bit of a non-starter as far as um, uh, I'm concerned, and the only value of it of today in discussing that topic has been for each of us to give our reasons why we we don't think much of the title, and therefore uh, we want to move on to something more substantial, namely what are the challenges that now face the international legal order uh, in the factual situation that exists in North Korea as portrayed in the report of the Commission of Inquiry, and uh, what are the challenges both to geopolitics and to human rights uh, that we have to face in the coming days uh, as unexpectedly and suddenly uh, we face the prospect that the President of the United States is going to meet the Supreme Leader of North Korea and we, we rather welcome that, I think, but uh, are apprehensive as to where it's all going to lead. Can I, can I interrupt for just a second and, and ask you, before we move on to the substance of the challenges, as you rightly point out, in terms of um, the emergence of this concept, this term, should we see it then purely as a political rhetorical device? Obviously, it's some have pointed out to the role of uh, former President George W. Bush, and his willingness to brand the so-called axis of evil, does it have any value in terms of encouraging states to adhere to norms or standards that the international community might wish them to adhere to? Uh, well, or, is it, or, is it, or is it more intended for domestic consumption on the part of the leaders inclined to use it? Uh, I th I, I, I'm, I'm inclined to think that it is a rhetorical device used mainly but not only in the United States domestic uh, politics, um, used to be a kind of swear word to isolate uh, a country that you don't much like, that has some features uh, like uh, not behaving in a conventional way and challenging uh, the power of um, uh, superpowers like the United States or the Russians no doubt have their rogue states. Um, and they might at the moment include the United Kingdom in the road states. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's a, a rather unintellectual exercise and, and therefore uh, it's really not one that's worthy of a lot of time at KCL. Okay. Sonia Pisaka, do you agree with that assessment? Uh, yeah, mostly I do. Uh, because uh, starting from your description of the world affairs nowadays, and, uh, end of the, and the, the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. We can see that most of these uh, states qualified as rogue are exactly the areas where two blocks have met, uh, Middle East, uh, Korean Peninsula, and where this, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, effort of America to uh, dominate these areas uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, were conducted to this uh, coining of this phrase, which is to, uh, absolutely, in, un, how should I say, not reflecting the real uh, meaning behind it, the real intent, mm -hmm. intents, uh, intent behind this uh, qualification. And I think it's really, uh, it needs to be re-examined and given up. And the last time when Donald Trump has used the term was when he was addressing UN uh, a few months ago and he used the same, the same phrase. And uh, I think this also tells us uh, uh, about this, uh, how should I say, international turbulence where all this, this geopolitical uh, struggle to 
take as much as possible uh, interest spheres also mm. reflects this kind of behavior, especially mm. of United States. Mm. And now that Russia has come back in a way, not in a way that it was there before, but also some other major countries like Turkey, like uh, India, like uh, Brazil, this also tells us that the Security Council is not representative today. And we can say that those five members have been violating norms and standards in many cases, especially, mm. especially uh, Russia and the US. So it's, there is much need, it's needed to have discussion about this and mm. change the structure of the mm. Security Council as the most important body within the UN system and most responsible, therefore. Um, thank you. Professor Miller, I mean, if, if the term is empty and doesn't have any real yes. value, what role should intellectuals play um, in trying to demonstrate? Is it important to actually push back against this rather cavalier use by politicians of the term to meet their own objectives? Uh, yes, I think uh, it, it is important. Uh, let me uh, offer first an, an understanding of what's built into the term uh, because uh, the defects that rogues are accused of are often very real. Uh, uh, they're accused of tyranny. They're accused of support for terrorism around the world. Often that is exaggerated. Uh, uh, rogue states are said to be uh, seeking to develop dangerous weapons, uh, including nuclear weapons. And often that's, that's right. Uh, what I think, uh, part agreeing and part reaching for some productive disagreement on the panel. Uh, what I think is fundamentally wrong about the category and then gives us a job to, to do, including the job you're asking about, uh, is uh, uh, the thought that if on these dimensions a uh, regime is bad enough, as bad as North Korea is now, Iran is uh, 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 said to be, Iraq and Libya were said to be, uh, this justifies certain kinds of forceful exclusion from the international community, uh, uh, marked, for example, by willingness to engage in uh, embargoes and ec broad economic sanctions uh, uh, meant to destroy the vitality of their whole economy. Uh, it's uh, that connection that I think is fundamentally wrong. I think uh, uh, that it would be much better for the US to be more transactional uh, in this respect, I, I guess I'm agreeing with Donald Trump without trusting his deal making uh, for a minute. Uh, for example, uh, it would be uh, good to negotiate a deal with North Korea that would stop it short of developing an arsenal of reliable long range nuclear missiles. And part of making that deal involves formal security guarantees that are unconnected with any assertive opprobrium for the brutal tyranny and violation of human rights of the North Korean regime. Not because they don't deserve that opprobrium, but because this would uh, be better for uh, humanity. The Iran uh, deal that was finally struck in Iran was a deal of getting close, but not quite there. Uh, uh, to uh, capa nuclear uh, uh, capability that's been on offer literally for decades and that was periodically sabotaged by U.S. influence on Iran being a rogue, part of an access of evil. So, uh, yeah, I agree that uh, the rogue state label uh, does no good, harms uh, 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 humanity, I think uh, 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 the right approach is piecemeal, is adjusted to realities of power, <laughs> and I think in facing responses to the regimes that the U.S. has labeled rogue, we should not be nostalgic for a stabilizing liberal international order. I think justified repugnance at Donald Trump has led to an idealization of that order that's, that's wrong, stabilizing, gosh, in Vietnam, in Iraq, in Central America, uh, in Yemen now, uh, that, uh, well, I don't know if it's regarded as a joke, but uh, uh, it uh, uh, certainly would uh, uh, be a term uh, seen with great chagrin. I think holding the U.S. back uh, 
from its habits of excess has to be part of what people outside of corridor, the corridors of power, should be doing in response to the real existence of bad governments in the world. When it comes to Donald Trump's transactional approach and the, um, the scenario you sort of laid out for us, or, or the, the course of action that you would recommend him to pursue, does that imply a hierarchy of values in terms of the type of, I don't know how to characterize them, the excesses that certain states are minded to, um, to follow? Is it, should we be prioritizing those states that are actually disruptive to their immediate neighbors um, and place relatively less priority on the internal conditions within certain states? Well, it, it, can one yes. generalize, or is this very much a function of where we are today in terms of the particular types of threats that international, that certain states represent to, I don't, know, I don't know whether we should call it the international order, yes. but at least to international society? Well, look, whenever uh, uh, there's an effort to uh, change a policy that's centrally important to a regime, uh, uh, there are uh, in forceful ways. I don't mean necessarily with military force, but in coercive ways. Uh, there are going to be troubling costs, right? There are going to be costs to, say, the innocent people who are harmed by comprehensive uh, uh, sanctions, huge costs if there is a uh, 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 military uh, intervention. Uh, let's suppose we're talking about those regimes that deserve utmost opprobrium, the sort of opprobrium that had a magnificent e exemplar in the report that Michael and uh, Sonia wrote on, on uh, North Korea, then I think the problem becomes that, the, morally speaking, uh, uh, the question that arises uh, in a decision to uh, uh, launch a war, though we're not probably talking about war, uh, are the costs to innocent people disproportionate, uh, given the likelihood of benefits uh, uh, to them? And that's just going to uh, uh, vary a lot from country to country for reasons that have nothing to do with the moral quality uh, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, regime. Uh, the continuation of uh, 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 sanctions in uh, North Korea hurts a lot of North Koreans and isn't going to change the regime in part because of what uh, uh, China will tolerate. Uh, kicking uh, uh, the tyrant Charles Taylor uh, uh, out of Liberia had no such uh, mm -hmm. repercussions. Putting him on trial uh, uh, was absolutely positive. So I think it's not, we're talking about deeply defective regimes mm -hmm. or we shouldn't be talking about them. I think in that context, consequences which often have to do with uh, r relationships of power in the world scene with nothing to do uh, 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 with moral characteristics of the regime, I think they tend to be primary. Mm. Okay, I, w I want to come back to this question of you know, how we define the states that are most egregious in terms of the challenge they pose to international society. But before that, um, Gina Heathcote, do you have any views on the question of definitions? Do you share the views of other panelists that this is a bit of a, a kind of anodyne what discussion? We don't want to use the expression. We don't want to define it because we don't think mm. it's scientific. We don't want to use it. Hmm. We want to get to the facts. We will. We will. I just want to make sure that everybody has a chance to express their view. It's certainly not a legal term. I must speak as an international lawyer. Um, I do think it's important that we pay attention to when states are using the term or when or terms like axis of evil or other language and the kind of thin analysis that then is Can't a, hear. a product Can of we, that. We Sorry. Use the microphone? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's just uh, drawing attention. Is this one on? To the thin analysis that is a product of um, the kind of identification of rogue states. So while we, I don't, it's not a legal term. Uh, Michael's already drawn our attention to this, um, but it is a term used by some states, and there is important to look at the effects of that. One of those would be the thin analysis that results, or what we talked about this morning, a crisis mentality. Um, and on that last point that you were discussing uh, with Richard, um, a kind of separation of what happens within the state from the geopolitical arrangements. And one of the things that I think is so prevalent in the report that 
Sonia and Michael have put together is that actually they go hand in hand. And um, if you look at it through the lens of gendered harms, we see that actually this is a very common occurrence um, in the same states where we're seeing geopolitical um, threats and, um, and the kind of uh, uh, aggressive behaviours. I think okay. we want to move on. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So let's turn then to the question of the, the, the countries in particular that we want to identify. Can we single out? Identify as what? <laughs> well, we're not going to us to go and, and identify them as rogue states. No, that I, no. is the parlance of the United States administration, yeah. uh, and it's and not all administrations of the United States. I don't want to lend it the legitimacy and credibility of having it discussed as a serious topic of international law or policy at this university. So I, I, I'm, not I'll opt out. I, I'm not advocating that we use the term. Let me be very clear. I'm just trying to say if... It's natural that you should come here mm. and have thought that we would have spent time carefully analysing what is a rogue state and no. so on. We didn't. We didn't mm. like the expression. Okay. And to now require us to go back and reconsider what the position we've reached hours ago is really, frankly, a bit of a waste of time. I'm not, I'm explicitly not doing that, okay? Let me just be very clear. I don't, I'm not trying to push the panel in any particular direction. Um, if we move on then to try and identify not rogue states, but just to broaden the question about the facts, the things that matter um, in terms of thinking about the challenges to international order. We talked about North Korea. Should we be focusing on North Korea at the expense of other states? Is it useful for us to try and um, well, it's pretty natural that we should focus on North Korea at the moment because of the very unusual, unexpected step that has been taken by uh, the President of the United States to meet without precondition at a place to be yet designated and before the end of May to talk about the denuclearization again of the Korean Peninsula. So that's quite an important development okay. that has happened. And no one uh, really expected it. And after they were th trading insults of uh, increasing mm. nastiness, mm. Uh, but we've now got it. And I think, therefore, one of the issues uh, that is helpful for us to discuss is uh, what are the challenges that are faced by this? What are the challenges in an administration, as Professor Miller pointed out, where uh, the uh, President is not apparently taking the assistance of the State Department, which is a very mm. great department of great intellect, uh, hasn't appointed an ambassador to the Republic of Korea uh, and doesn't have the sort of backup to go into a dialogue. What are the dangers of this? And one immediate danger that I see is that in that cir circumstance, human rights is just going to be thrown in the waste mm. paper basket mm. or uh, put under the carpet. And that really is not what the Charter of the United Nations, what international law of human rights uh, requires, and what, in some views, the interests of the United States of America as a great democratic country and of uh, the Western community and of the United Nations itself require. So uh, that that's really where we, I think, had come to in, in the course of the day that there are uh, opportunities and dangers, and how do we maximise the opportunities okay. and how do we minimise the dangers? To what extent is the character of Donald Trump um, and the nature of the American political system a problem in this context? How, to what extent is, and can, can Donald Trump be restrained in any way to keep the attention focused on the human rights agenda? Or should we accept that these talks, that maybe talks about talks, if they happen in May, are actually going to allow space to be created to focus on the human rights issues as well as these broader security concerns. Can I mention one serious, yeah. well, semi-serious disagreement that mm. came up during the day between Professor Miller and myself. Mm -hmm. Professor Miller th thinks I'm a bit of a starry-eyed dreamer on <laughs> human rights. Mm -hmm. I think he's a hard-nosed realist, mm -hmm. but that he's forgetting that there is a new world order of human rights which belong to individuals under the Charter, under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was a great creation of the uh, human family uh, in which Eleanor Roosevelt presided and a great legacy to the world community, which we shouldn't let go. So 
the question is how do you reconcile universal human rights if to threaten Kim Jong-un with uh, action because of his many breaches of human rights shown in the COI report, how do you stand firm by human rights when that may completely undermine the chance of getting rid of the nuclear weapons of North Korea, which are a great danger to the world's um, uh, geopolitical safety, but mm. also to individual human rights because of the danger mm. of nuclear weapons. That was really, I think, an important issue that came up, and the example of South Africa was given to us. Uh, was that a path that might work in the case of uh, North Korea, and should we go down that path or find some other way to ensure that we don't dump human rights because mm. of our desperation to get rid of uh, uh, the nuclear weapons in North Korea and all the other North Koreas that stand behind that may come along unless we deal with the problem now. Professor Miller, is it a case of dumping human rights or is it a, is it a kind of sequencing question? Because, of course, in the American Senate there are plenty of critics of the DPRK uh, who focus on the human rights agenda. Donald Trump himself, in his State of the Union address, placed the human rights question seemingly front and centre in recognising the tragedy of Otto Wombrio's family, who had seen their son brutalised, apparently, by the North Korean regime. We still don't know the exact circumstances. Should we expect the United States to first focus on the security dimension and then create space to look at the human rights issue? And in doing that, are there opportunities to, as the South Koreans presumably would argue, to bring North Korea out of the cold? One of the demands that Pyongyang has asked yes. to have recognised is a peace treaty, uh, and a peace treaty that will normalise relations with a state that seems to some people, whether we call it rogue or abnormal or whatever it might be, as part of that political demonisation, to be outside the fold. I think the alternatives that you've described involve deeply important choices. I think it would probably be most productive to talk in the first instance about what the United States government should do and what its ramifications for the human rights regime, let's call it, would be. Uh, the reason I, I say this is this. Uh, Donald Trump is, is very unpredictable. Uh, in whatever course he takes, you're certainly right that domestic U.S. politics uh, 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 are going to be important. He can play a certain leadership role, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, with those who are hawkish about U.S. foreign mm -hmm. policy, because the, the hawks tend to be, though they aren't always Republican, and for electoral reasons, he has considerable command over Republican votes in Congress. So what should the United States do? And here is something that uh, uh, I'm trying to work out with Michael and Sonia. I think Jean is on my side, but maybe she'll betray me. Or maybe there are no sides here. Maybe we really uh, agree. It seems to me that it would be a bad idea for the President of the United States in these negotiations to have a human rights agenda uh, uh, to assert the opprobrium that uh, the regime in North Korea observes and to try to make the negotiations an instrument for that opprobrium. Because you are absolutely right that for decades the emphasis of North Korea has been on normalizing diplomatic relations and achieving uh, uh, formal security guarantees that sort of emphasis is going to make Kim Jong-un think that it's just not there uh, uh, for normalization and security guarantees. That is going to make him much more reluctant to do what he might do in the way of a quid, quid pro quo, uh, which is to uh, put to one side indefinitely in exchange the development of an arsenal of reliable long-range nuclear weapons. Mm. People asked in our discuss, last discussion, and I think it's important <clears throat> in this context, mm. 
isn't Kim Jong-un's invitation, as we think it is, let's suppose uh, uh, there, there's uh, been one, isn't that a reflection of the productiveness of the stringent sanctions, the comprehensive ones that have really hurt the North Korean economy uh, uh, that are part of the rogue state doctrine? And I think it's important to emphasize here, not, in, not entirely clear, I think probably not, uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, uh, bottom line is what's been North Korea's bottom line for decades, except that he's probably going to offer less. He's probably not going to give up the nuclear uh, bomb arsenal that he has, though nuclear we uh, missiles uh, 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 are probably uh, on the, the, uh, the table. Uh, that's uh, an offer in exchange for security guarantees that's recurrently been torpedoed, for example, with the end of the agreed framework by the rogue state response to North Korea. I think new negotiations are probably on the table because the current brutal tyrant of North Korea now has an arsenal of atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. So he has a bargaining chip that he didn't have before and Alas, it's not a nice world. Uh, I think, as part of the quid pro quo, he should be allowed to cash in his bargaining chip, at least for a promise of not developing reliable, long-range nuclear weapons. That, in any case, is why I think he's come to the table. And one thing that this shows us is we mustn't just demonize Republican presidents who aren't the true liberals in the liberal national order. The truly stringent yeah, sanctions are Barack Obama's. Your, your, your presentation of the role of the United States assigns it an understandable primacy in these negotiations. But I'm struck by the fact that in, when we think about the human rights agenda, it's the role of America's allies in this context. I'm thinking of Japan, for whom the human rights question, where North Korea is... You know, the question of abducted Japanese citizens somewhere in the order of 20, 30, perhaps as many as 80, abducted in the 1970s and 80s. It's been a key issue for the Japanese throughout this issue. How do we accommodate the roles of secondary powers who might have primary interests that are focused on human rights? Uh, well, I, I'm afraid that Japan and South Korea at this moment are more concerned of nuclear potential of uh, North Korea mm. and human rights. For example, North uh, Japan mm. has agreed to 13 abducted people. They don't want to tackle the issue of maybe hundreds, as we have heard mm. from different NGOs in Tokyo when mm. we talk to them. So they agreed to 13 abducted people, and mm. they don't want to go further than that. Uh, South Korean uh, new president is also trying to engage more in dialogue. So, and uh, when we were putting together this report on accountability, we didn't find uh, either Tokyo or Seoul to be ready to prosecute people uh, according to the universal jurisdiction. So they are really at this moment considering political aspect, mm -hmm. not the human rights aspect. Human rights at this moment is kept on the agenda by international NGOs, NGOs in uh, South Korea and <coughs> in the region, and also by UN certain bodies. Mm -hmm. So it is not an issue at this moment. It's really separated, unfortunately. Although public opinion in Japan still uh, feels very yeah, animated but because by this issue. Uh, yeah. uh, Prime Minister Abe had made an issue out of it, and he mm. was uh, really uh, following this uh, issue uh, into, uh, how should I say, situations when he was to be re-elected and so mm. on. So it's also, and while we talk to those people, of missing families of missing uh, people, they are very much concerned, and it's strong lobby in Japan. Mm. But I think they are more concerned with the possibilities of uh, uh, nuclear not threat, but uh, mistakes made by these tests and so on. I don't think uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un would attack anybody on purpose at this moment. Mm. But there might be an error in these mm. tests which of can course, affect yes. uh, either South Korea or Japan. So their concerns are really about uh, what will happen, whether there will be collapse of state or not. They're preparing some kind of scenarios how to help refugees. But also, I think, politically speaking, they're on the same line. And Donald Trump never mentioned human rights in his speeches over the last year, not only relating to North Korea, to nobody. 
So it's not an issue for him. Except the State of the Union address, where <laughs> yes. he was very explicit. Yeah, yeah. but that's not, much, yes, that's he, not enough. He talked of uh, Mr. Warmbier um, and his death, and also of a um, Korean refugee who had come to Washington and had displayed the cruelty of uh, the North yeah. Korean mm -hmm. regime. But behind your question was a good point, if I can say so respectfully, and that was that um, the Japanese feeling about uh, the um, abductions uh, is tied up with a sense of affront and uh, deserve, deserved affront mm. uh, at the coming into Japan and the seizure of their citizens living peacefully in their own country. Uh, and uh, uh, though the Commission of Inquiry thought that there were more than the 13 or 16 that the Japanese government acknowledge, um, it is not uh, as against the hundreds of thousands that uh, other, uh, other issues uh, arise. For example, in the case of the prisoners of war who were not returned mm. to, from North Korea to South Korea, despite the terms of the armistice, uh, and the uh, citizens of the Republic of Korea, South Korea, who were seized by North Korea and have uh, been kept there, and the family reunion meetings have not been held, this is really part of a barbarous way of dealing with human relationships of family who speak the same language, who have the same culture, who are living on the same peninsula and are just up the road uh, from... Um, contact with their family. So it's it's the abduction and the indifference to the abduction that presents a country which is dealing in a, in a way that is not conformable to universal human rights. And that's why it is important. And in the present moment, the concern must be that if this is just to be a deal between the President of the United mm. States and the Supreme Leader of North Korea, um, and if that's the path we're set upon, then that leaves out at least four other parties who were members of the six-party talks. Mm. Um, Japan, uh, the Russian Federation, uh, and um, uh, the uh, Republic of Korea uh, that are not being brought into the dialogue. Mm. And that... Uh, is a, a cause of some concern, really, because if they're not happy with the deal that is struck, well, where, what sort of utility is that deal going to have for the long-term peace of the peninsula? Absolutely. How do we make it last, really? Um, Gina Heathcote, I mean, the question of human rights, I mean, Lord David Alton, who has spent a lot of time in the British Parliament, making the case for human rights dialogue with the DPRK, has argued that um, you can achieve progress, albeit piecemeal and small progress, in actually persuading regimes that have an appalling record on human rights to begin the process of engaging and actually having a discussion. Are there examples that you can cite or that, that would reinforce that point of view, or do you think it's it's unduly optimistic for political actors to make the claim that by opening the door to discussion, you can actually make progress with these sorts of regimes? Um, I don't know about examples, mm. but we can certainly see plenty of examples where a failure to engage at that level mm. has prolonged um, or created the conditions for conflict or return mm. to conflict. Um, and I think sort of positing this binary, we should we include human rights or and talking about accountability mm. versus kind of pursuing just uh, the kind of security agenda leaves out a whole lot of discussions. And some of the things, the notes I have from Sonia's talk this afternoon just sort of resonate. And one of the th things she spoke about was change from within. Mm. And if you want legitimate change from within that's meaningful to those that are suffering these human rights abuses, um, then I can't see how you can only focus on the security component, mm. for example. Um, and the other thing that Sonia spoke to, I think, much more eloquently than I did, although I did mention it this morning, was about the potential of regional human rights mechanisms or agendas and speaking about uh, and developing the strength of human rights tools amongst uh, the neighbouring countries as well. But I really think this idea of change from within...
is so important. Um, how do we m not only mobilise change with respect to the grave kind of security threats uh, that we're talking about, but a transformative space internally to the state? And this is why this report's so important. The Commission of Inquiry looks at precisely this issue. And there's, there's not an easy solution. If we want to look at past practice, we know that interventions, international military interventions, particularly poor tool, for example. Mm -hmm. But the security agenda leads us towards increasingly those kind of security solutions. Mm -hmm. Michael Kirby made the point, and, and uh, Sonny Baserka also, about the role of, of additional countries, additional parties, non-state actors. Mm -hmm. In the context of North Korea, of course, we have new initiatives in a European context. Um, the BBC has set up its Korean language broadcast service oh, yeah. in, mm -hmm. in an effort to try and effect change from within. Um, does, the panel, does the panel have a sense of whether you think, the members think that that is an appropriate way forward, is likely to be effective? Or is it going to make it harder to engage with the regime at a level that's going to be meaningful? Well, there are a couple of factors against it, it being um, effective. Uh, first, the President of the United States keeps talking about making America great again. He's not really focused on the international community and the, uh, even on the Western community of which the United States of America had a, a, a leadership role after the Second World War. It, it doesn't seem to figure very much in his thinking. So that that is a problem. Second, uh, he also is very concerned, I would think, with his electoral um, situation, and he's therefore going to be very keen, some might even say desperately keen, to produce the goods uh, for American electors. And that is not necessarily going to be the same as would be sought by electors in the Republic of Korea or electors in uh, the in Japan or, or uh, in other in other countries. So, um, uh, so I, I think what what we need is somebody who has a more cosmopolitan and a better informed view about the nuances of the relationships and the history of the relationships, the fractious feelings between Japan and both Korean states, um, and uh, the different agenda which the Republic of Korea will have to um, ha have a reconciliation of some kind with North Korea, which is a natural feeling on their part. Uh, so it, it, it calls for subtlety and uh, flexibility of thinking, uh, and I'm just not sure that we're going to see that. But um, you have to give credit to uh, President Trump that he sees the moment and that it's going ahead. We only have to hope it doesn't all end in tears, which is a possibility. Professor Miller. Um Subtle leaders, um, UN Secretary General, does he have a role in this context to try and bind Donald Trump to a, an outcome that would be more responsive to the interests of other actors in the international system? I think it's important not to be uh, too focused on uh, leaders here. No, I, I don't think the UN Secretary General, uh, very few people have any influence on on. on Donald Trump. I think sycophants who juice him up uh, uh, have a kind of, of influence, but certainly not the UN Secretary General. Uh, I, uh, I think that is what it is, and uh, we should take very seriously uh, uh, Gina's point about the existence of a very complex division of labor here. We should take it seriously because it provides an option that otherwise wouldn't exist for not giving up on human rights in North Korea. It does seem to me that in negotiations between uh, uh, the, the current uh, uh, brutal tyrant of the Kim dynasty, whoever he is, and the US president, whoever he is, that there shouldn't be insistence on asserting uh, uh, the vileness of the uh, uh, Korean regime, because that will do North Korean citizens no good whatever, 
indeed it may harm them because nationalism is the one basis for uh, 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 popular support that the Kim dynasty uh, uh, can rely on. Anti-US nationalism uh, based in part on memories of horrors perpetrated by the US uh, uh, in the Korean War. It's not going to hurt, help uh, uh, North Korea citizens. Uh, it will endanger the world by making uh, uh, believable security guarantees impossible. Uh, let's not do it. But uh, uh, there are other actors involved. Uh, there are international agencies who are powerless, right? I mean, the Human Rights Council is powerless. And yet, I think Michael and Sonia use the Human Rights Agency for an important forum for exposing uh, uh, the situation in uh, North Korea. Uh, media do uh, in... Uh, 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 Britain and in the US uh, with some possibilities, as you've mentioned, of reaching out. Above all now, I think, there is another agent, uh, the uh, current administration in, in South Korea, uh, uh, Moon Jae-in, is of a party that believes in enhancing interaction between the North and the South, uh, a party who, that I think wants the uh, negotiations to succeed on the basis that I've described, in part because this would be a basis for enhanced cooperation more economically, more ease in visiting between the North and South, a process that might conceivably, and it might take 10, 20, 30 years lead to a situation in which the economic liberalization that Kim uh, uh, Jong-un uh, uh, does favor will be transformed into a process that can lead to humanizing political change. I don't know. I don't believe anybody who says that he or she knows. But I think that's a much better prospect for improving human rights than negotiations in which Kim, the current regime, is assertively denounced. Though, of course, the U.S. should periodically express concern, as the U.S. periodically expresses concern on human rights in China and does nothing really about it, which I think is the right thing to not do. Sonia Vasekou, Professor Miller has, I think, very persuasively made the case that um, South Korea, in a sense, is in the full foreground of efforts to to normalize relations with the North. If you like, this is the natural extension of Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy, yep. avoiding demonization, recognizing that there are historical, cultural, linguistic ties that bind Koreans together. Um, should other states and other actors be doing the same? I mean, for example, in the case of, even in the United Kingdom's case, we've had contact now with North Korea for over 16, if not 17 years. No, um, we've had bilateral contact at the university level. My own university has received North Korean students. And what's been striking about that level of engagement is the extent to which the appetite for young North Koreans to engage with the outside world is very palpable. Yeah. Are there lessons from other conflict situations that could be applied in this context where Europe and European actors can play a role to amplify or to support the efforts that Moon Jae-in, who after all has been, in less than a year, extraordinarily successful, not only in reaching out to North Korea, some would argue, reaching out to Donald Trump to, to persuade him or to capitalize on his own vanity to change course and to recognize the benefit of dialogue as opposed to conflict. I think we have to give a chance to that. And uh, uh, I think, first of all, a uh, young leader is very much concerned with the safety of his family, especially after Arab Spring's mm -hmm. failure, where he learned a lesson that it might happen to him as well. Mm -hmm. So this is why, in my view, maybe I'm wrong, this is why he escalated this nuclear program to the point, to the level where he can negotiate from. In the meantime, not only that he undertook some economic measures, he did uh, uh, sharpen the crossing of the border, but inside the country he introduced some economic measures, and also he sends around the students 
not only to Britain, but also to Shanghai and other places mm -hmm. to study. So he obviously has something in his mind and the purges that he had within administration, he replaced all these people by younger people. So this is, I don't know what is his concept, mm -hmm. but this is what we hear about. So he obviously is focused now on uh, saving the family. Whether he will keep the, uh, the position in the country, this is another thing. But on the other side, I think all the neighboring countries should uh, help society to come out, to educate young people, give them scholarships and so on, because only in the long run you can change the mindset of these people. You know, to have uh, a glimpse at the outside world, to see how people live outside, especially in South Korea. Because uh, I'm always going from our example. Milosevic was brought down, and we have today again the president who was part of his program. So, you know, in 20 years' time, nothing much changed. Mm. It's a long process of, uh, how should I say, changing the political culture, mindset, uh, accepting certain rule norms and, and, and uh, standards, because you must have in mind that uh, North Korea is deeply corrupted, because that was a, a, a way of surviving for most of the people. Mm. They crossed the border by bribing the customs <laughs> officers and so on. And it is very difficult to bring the society back to some kind of decency. It takes ages and to, you know, to establish rule of law, uh, institutions which function, to teach people uh, ethics, uh, especially in judiciary, police and so on. So it cannot happen overnight. So there needs to be some kind of openness towards North Korea people, specialists, mm -hmm. professionals, young people, and so on, if you want some changes in the long run. Kim Il-jong-un Il Jong -un will not uh, leave so easily, especially mm -hmm. once he makes an agreement with uh, America. It will be only on denuclearization. I don't know how they will cope with the US uh, base, military base in South Korea. I think he has this also in mind. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens now. M much that. to the worry of the Japanese, yes. of course. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Japanese should, uh, I think they're mostly focused now. I talked to some in the embassy in Belgrade, how to help uh, refugees in the case of the collapse of the state. And they have a lot of uh, historical legacy, which is negative. Comfort women, you know, and domination over North Korea and uh, of, uh, Korean Peninsula for 35, 40 years. So they don't push strongly on that. Mm. You know, even this settlement about 13 abducted people is also, I think, uh, one of the reasons uh, mm. uh, to abide with the possibility to talk with the, with the North Korea. So it's, uh, it's really takes effort, not only of uh, uh, Republic of Korea and United States, but I think entire international community, mm. especially those surrounding North Korea. I'm conscious that we don't have a great deal of time left, so I'd like to open it up to the audience uh, and take questions. Um, we've focused our discussion exclusively on North Korea, um, but I think that reflects the gravity of the situation. But who would like to ask a question? Yes. And can you tell us who in particular on the panel do you want all of us to answer, or do you have a particular person in mind or a comment? Yeah, grab the microphone. Hi, Lucy Bailey. I work at BBC World Service Radio. We interviewed um, uh, Justice Kirby this morning. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to ask a couple of unrelated questions. And the first one was to do with um, what, what we want or what we should be wanting Donald Trump or anybody else to try and get out of the North Koreans at this stage when there seems to be a little crack of opening. Um, and somebody we have on the World Service quite often is a guy called John Delury, who I don't know, you know, based in South Korea. And his argument, I mean, I'm summarizing dreadfully, but he's, he has always thought that um, Kim Jong-un has really wanted two things. One is the nukes, and the other one is economic development. And that if you'd basically love-bombed him, if, once you get in the room with him, if you can get past the nuke thing, if you can, you know, say, okay, we'll drop some of the sanctions if you drop the nukes, could you then maybe go even further and offer him something really good in exchange for sorting out the human rights situation? I mean, we shouldn't just stop at the nukes. And the other thing I wanted to ask was, I know that after the Commission's report, you wanted um, the Security Council to refer North Korea to the International Criminal Court. That obviously didn't happen because there's Russia and China on the Security Council. But is the, is the judicial angle, the idea of, of actually prosecuting somebody at some point 
so ridiculous that it's not even worth talking about at this stage because we just know that it's not going to happen. Okay. Can we start, Professor Miller, if you want to uh, take those two points? Well, I, 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 I'm a great admirer of uh, uh, John Delury's uh, uh, work. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, he should be admired for uh, seeing uh, Kim Jong-un as having uh, this double-barreled uh, policy because uh, it's quite explicit uh, on, on Kim Jong-un's part. Uh, it's uh, uh, Delury's view, and I think this is uh, plausible, that uh, what Kim Jong-un might be willing to do uh, is to say, okay, uh, I've achieved uh, 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 my uh, nuclearization uh, uh, goal. I, I have these uh, uh, bombs. Uh, now, what, uh, what you can do for me is give me a formal security guarantee, diplomatic normalization, which has always been the core of uh, uh, the North Korean policy in uh, 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 these negotiations, and then I will go no further. Won't go further to develop uh, uh, an arsenal of reliable long-range nuclear missiles. Uh, perhaps if the security guarantees and the normalization go far enough, there'll be diminishment, uh, uh, even uh, uh, ending of the nuclear bomb arsenal as such. But there's a lot of history there of uh, a U.S. declarations that the regime is an, an axis or an axis of evil, that it should be ended. Uh, uh, it seems to me that in Delury's correct view, that's a long shot for the indefinite uh, uh, future. Now, what about moving on, having gotten whatever one can uh, uh, in the realm of nuclear, denuclearization? Uh, to uh, uh, human rights concessions, uh, it seems to me that that's uh, uh, not realistic because that's an issue of the power of endurance of this regime. Any one party regime depends on ignorance and fear as a basis for stability. That's even been part of uh, the one party regime which I think uh, in China, which for decades uh, uh, I supported because it was plausible that that stability was needed for economic development that would liberate uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people. I think that time is over, but in any case, there too. In the case of uh, uh, the Kim dynasty, uh, its endurance uh, uh, depends on uh, handing out a, a, a fairly uh, uh, good life uh, uh, to an elite and trying for a tolerable life uh, uh, for the rest of uh, society, but not a life of the kind that would uh, lead them to give absolute power to one person, the current representative of the Kim regime, uh, without dire restrictions of, of human rights. So here and there, yes, perhaps, but I would think not as the basis of a formal agreement but is a response to this particular criticism in that. To follow up on your point in the context of the United States, um, John Delory's argument that economic incentivization will work because the Byungjin line, the policy of equally pursuing strategic development and economic progress, um, is going to be something that Kim Jong-un really identifies with. How do you how do you marry that approach with the view of many people in the United States that any sort of economic reward to North Korea is going to be seen as betraying America's principles and, of course, is going to weaken the sanctions regime, which is, to quote your earlier observations, one of the key factors that has arguably brought Kim Jong-un back to the table? Uh, well, of, of course, I'm, uh, I'm not so sure that it was... I don't think it was necessary to bring... Uh, uh, him back to this particular table on uh, uh, on on this particular basis, uh, but you know who are these people uh, in in the United States? There, I don't think the vast majority of, uh, of the electorate has uh, uh, a strong view one or the other. It wouldn't keep them uh, if they care about uh, this aspect of foreign policy from. Uh, heaving a sigh of relief 
uh, if there was a uh, restriction of nuclearization in North Korea uh, uh, that the U.S. would uh, 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 acknowledge uh, as such. Uh, uh, not being assertive about human rights in North Korea, uh, this is an electorate that uh, tolerates uh, the U.S. having uh, Saudi Arabia as uh, uh, its main uh, ally in the Middle East. I don't think they have great objections to U.S. support for, uh, 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 for tyrants. There will be uh, people with hawkish foreign policies in Congress who uh, uh, would vigorously oppose uh, 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 this agreement. <sighs> Maybe they will win if Trump isn't on their side. He'll be pretty formidable because of his direct appeal to most people uh, 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 in, in their base. Uh, but I, I, I don't think popular uh, uh, resistance to giving in on uh, human rights will, uh, will be decisive. Michael Kirby. Well, here's my agenda for the uh, peace discussions. First of all, I think you'd have to put the easy things. This is what Dip Diplomacy 101 teaches you. You take the easy things first. So I would follow what the Germans did in the run-up to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, I would uh, drop the Holstein Doctrine, which the Germans had and which effectively is in place, that anyone who deals with North Korea is an enemy of, uh, that, deal, that dealt with um, East Germany was an enemy of West Germany. Uh, you'd, you'd have to remove that impediment uh, for dealing with them. You'd then have to try to open up family reunions. It really is barbarous that there are people now all in their old age who are not uh, going to survive for very much longer who would love to see their families. They've had a lottery. How cruel can you get to, to have the right to meet a member of your family who's just up the road? Um, I would move for twinning of cities, sporting contests. They, they've shown they love that, and not just in the Winter Olympics. They've had uh, soccer meetings where the, the audience in South Korea, in Incheon, kept shouting out, we are one. And when a, a North Korean uh, player fell over, he was picked up by the South Korean player. Very emotional scenes. I mean, if we don't have a separated people, we don't fully understand this. Uh, I work towards cultural contacts and do all these easy things, or relatively easy things first. Then moving quickly into economic things. Uh, reopen Kaesong, uh, the, uh, the joint economic zone. Uh, reopen the discussions about energy, which President Clinton uh, promised, but which uh, it wasn't ever fully delivered. Uh, promise to re reopen the internet, maybe with the Chinese type characteristics that limit uh, the contact. Uh, it's said that Kim Jong-un is very fascinated by internet technology. Uh, and Mr. Trump to come with a big checkbook uh, with tourism uh, as the, the sweetener, to have lots of tourists going up there staying in Trump hotels. This is something that uh, ought to be on everyone's mind. Then you start to go into the difficult things. Uh, guarantee of security, an ultimate peace treaty, an end to uh, any nuclear tests, an end to missiles, the South Koreans agreeing and with the Americans not to conduct their, their, um, their um, um, uh, the, uh, military exercises, um, and then moving up into um, a greater freedom of access to information. Uh, and uh, parked on the side would be the issue of human rights, but not surrendered, not given away, because it's not Mr Trump's to give it away. Um, but uh, uh, all of this has to be conducted against the background of attitudes in South Korea. Before she was removed from office, President Park told us, the thing that is closest to the heart of every Korean is reunification. Uh, and that is from a president who, who and whose family were 
basically very suspicious of reunification. Uh, and uh, in other parts of South Korea, there is great suspicion that the so-called sunshine policy, if you go to the museum uh, in uh, Seoul, it has uh, plenty of statements in the museum saying that the sunshine policy led to a sellout, uh, a lot of money passed hands, and in the end, it didn't really deliver the goods uh, to uh, South Korea. So, um, uh, Mr. Trump can't ignore those sensitivities in South Korea, but there is a graded strategy that you could be dealing with things that you can give away, some of them easier, some of them really quite difficult, but uh, if you've got that, then the job of diplomats is to try and fashion a, a deal which takes you step by step until you ultimately get enough consensus to say that we can dismantle this, uh, this regime or, or at least those aspects of the regime that are intolerable to a liberal democracy. Can I just um, I intentionally um, push you and take a, a very contrary position? Everything you say seems eminently reasonable and seems designed to recognize the mutual interests of Koreans. Uh, and yet, when you talk to young Koreans in their 20s and 30s about the issue of reunification, no, so. young Koreans are much more skeptical. For them, the cost of this is unsustainable. Their own preoccupations with their own lifestyles and the fact that they've grown up accepting the fact that they have their own South Korean identity, it means that they don't see the world in the same way as Moon Jae-in or Park, Park Geun-hye. And, and in this context, how constraining is the timetable? You know, the things that you're, you're very persuasively, I think, mentioning are going to take a long, long time to actually come to fruition or to be part of any serious negotiations. You mentioned, of course, the absence of seasoned diplomats on the American side. Is there a danger that what Donald Trump is looking for here, if he has a strategy, and it's questionable whether he has one, is actually to see these talks fail and then in turn make the argument much more assertively for military action? And in that context, our European leaders, our international representatives, people who are engaged with this issue, doing enough to warn the international community that you may be actually moving much, much faster towards an actual military conflict than this initial optimism is, has suggested. Don't forget that there were a lot of Germans who were very suspicious, and President Mitterrand says, I like Germany so much, I think there all should be two of them. Uh, and that would be a common feeling in, in many circles in South Korea, as you say. But just the same, I think the reaction to the recent Winter Olympics, uh, the reaction in the big soccer match in Incheon, it shows that deep down is this visceral feeling of commonality, of a shared uh, history. Uh, and if the young people are selfish, then they've got to be told to get their noses out of their mobile phones and to think more largely of, of, the, of the future of their country and... Uh, and propaganda. Huh? Propaganda. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, none of this is easy. I think you're a bit cynical about, I think Mr. Trump wants to get a deal. Uh, that would give him a historical status and it would give him a deserved uh, re-election as President of the United States if he could accomplish this. Because the bottom line in a deal is getting rid of the existential threat to the species, the human species, that lies in, a, in North Korea and the other North Koreas of this world coming along and breaking the non-proliferation uh, treaty. That is a really dangerous moment for human history and unless we seize this moment, uh, if we lose this moment, well, it's a very bad loss for the human species. And in the end of it, what does it matter what regime there is in North Korea in terms of the governance of the country, that it's an inefficient economy, that it's autocratic and so on, if, if we're going to wipe out the human species? And it is not too much to say this. It is not too much to say the fact that immediately so many countries signed on in the General Assembly to the Ban Treaty indicates that this is something that really matters to a lot of countries of the world and I think rightly matters. 
because if we just keep risking the mistakes and errors that can happen through too many countries having nuclear weapons uh, or building up the nuclear weapon, as Mr Putin and Mr Trump have both said they'll do, yeah. then uh, really the long-term uh, risks of accidents, mistakes or weekend rage is uh, are such that you've got to be very worried about our survival. Sonia Vesoka, do you agree? We're being yes. too pessimistic in assuming that Donald Trump doesn't want to reach a deal. Well, I, I think I agree with Michael that he has a lot of uh, concern in terms of getting something good for the country because his image and the image of America is so degraded over the last year that he will want some kind of uh, success story. And in the meantime, he lost the uh, elections in pa Pennsylvania and he might uh, lose the congressional uh, elections at the end of the year. So there are many uh, aspects of his concern that he may want to succeed with this uh, deal with North Korea. Okay. Gina, do you share this um, yeah. checklist of things that should be done? Do you, uh, are there things that should be added to it? Or, um... uh, I think Michael's list was impressive and helpful and showed us that it really isn't about one thing. It's not about one meeting. Um, I have got in my notes the nicest thing anyone said about Trump was that he is unpredictable. Mm. So this kind of question of what do we want Trump to achieve, I was accused of being utopian this morning, for idealistic, for bringing gender issues into the discussion, idealistic, not utopian. But I think it's quite idealistic to think that we can have any idea what, what Trump's about and, and, and what will be achieved. Um, uh, yeah, and looking to the region and thinking about what individuals, wow. people in the region, desire and well, Bush became want to work towards is so important, which is, I think, also at the heart of what Michael's saying. Bush became president in Question here. Just wait for the microphone, please. So, listening to a lot of the conversation here brings me to... Nixon going to China in 1972. China had been in total chaos, cultural revolution, atomic bomb, and a major threat to the world. And you look at China today. He never went in with any form of human rights. I can't remember exactly what his aim was in going to China, but it seemed to have changed the parameters of the whole Far East with world uh, power. I just don't, I'm just wondering, just from listening to this, possibly you might have some comments on that. Let me just make one observation um, personally. I was in Japan last week, um, shortly after the announcement was made by Donald Trump, and the sense of shock on the part of Japanese officials who remember that statement back in July of 1971 when Richard Nixon announced to the world with just 20 minutes notice to the then Japanese government of what was about to happen. For, for that generation of diplomats, the sense of betrayal that their closest ally had suddenly spun on a dime and changed the best part of 20 years of containment policy was a sense of great betrayal. And there is a similar sense, I think, in Tokyo. Mr. Abe has maintained a very hard-line position towards North Korea, with the emphasis on pressure as opposed to dialogue, even though he has had channels which he could use in the past. His predecessor did, Prime Minister Koizumi. Koizumi. So, I mean, I think, um, like many of the other panelists, I welcome this opportunity for dialogue, but there is, I think, a profound sense in, of uncertainty it's exactly that unpredictability of Donald Trump that makes many people in Japan worry what may come out of these negotiations. A Donald Trump that is so intent on getting a deal that is willing to compromise on the security of his allies by, for example, withdrawing troops from the region or potentially shortchanging the priority needs of the Japanese government, which after all are dominated by the immediate medium range ballistic threat to Japan as opposed to the long range missile threat that the United States faces has meant that people are nervous. But they're equally nervous that if the talks fail, then the, the pressure for conflict will go up. And for Japan... 
Then we'll have another panel, yes. yes but that, um, that, 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 uh, I think in fairness, uh, I can understand the apprehensions in Japan. I can understand the risks, but the risks of doing nothing and allowing the exp expansion of uh, nuclear states after North Korea is such a great one for humanity that we've got to be willing to take some risks. And it doesn't necessarily follow if the talks fail that you thereby are, are authorizing any crazy military adventure that the United States of America decides to undertake. Uh, and one hopes that the memory of the body bags and the memory uh, and the knowledge of the number of Americans in uniform now and the many demands upon their military at the moment uh, without a, a new and dangerous uh, war in a most inhospitable terrain, uh, which uh, there should be still enough people around to tell them what a dangerous and, and a difficult place it is to have a war. Um, I think it's if if all that we do is we get back to where we are now, then at least we have tried to see if we can make a step forward for humanity, for our species, for all the beauties of the world, for this lovely blue planet in the middle of a very insignificant galaxy, of a most unimportant star, uh, and and here we are talking about. Uh, the P Korean People Workers' Party and things of that kind. I mean, really, there are more important existential issues to be resolved. And one just hopes that these two leaders can see the big issues. And if they don't, then that doesn't authorise the taking of a military adventure against uh, North Korea, nuclear or non-nuclear. A final word? <laughs> Since we're at... The, almost the seven o'clock mark, your thoughts on either the relevance of, of the 1971 parallel, Nixon well, visit to China? A, I think this is a good example uh, when you make a courageous step forward that you may succeed. And I think this is a momentum where the uh, United States can do it again, maybe. Uh, I'm not really uh, certain that uh, Trump understands what is going on, but I, as I said, he needs a success story. So hopefully it can be a first step forward. It's very nice that we're ending on a hopeful note. It doesn't usually happen in 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 this uh, day and age. Uh, I'm not sure how much hope in the way of uh, uh, a bright prediction for the negotiations uh, uh, is in order. I, I think we just don't know. Uh, uh, Trump's political uh, support is based on tax cuts. Uh, it's based on uh, economic nationalism, for example, uh, uh, the tariffs. Uh, it's uh, uh, based on uh, covert appeals to uh, white nationalism, and often they are uh, uh, based on an anti-immigrant stance. So I don't think success in this is vital to his uh, uh, mix. On the other hand, he's in a relatively good position to sell the deal that we started to support. Nixon had compelling great power reasons to recognize China. Non-recognition, once the regime was so securely in place, had come to make no sense. Uh, he could sell that as a Republican president in the way in which at the time a Democrat could not have sold it. What I, what I find hopeful then, I've just thrown up my hands about the future, uh, is the sort of possibility of progress that Michael has described. Uh, and I think it's one that can spread among people in the human rights community. Michael was describing a series of steps that involved common ground with the North Korean tyrant, with the current South Korean uh, uh, regime, and the United States. Uh, uh, they didn't involve any preconditions about human rights. I'm going to put to one side Michael's, since Michael quickly said at the end about in a vaguely defined future, we might put vaguely defined pressure on North Korea. Uh, that's too vague. Uh, 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 to worry me. What Michael did emphasize is a series of steps involving common ground in interactions 
between the North and South that are feasible. And I think that this approach should appeal to people who care about human rights, who can be part of the public for an eventual settlement of the kind that we're talking about. Because I'm sure that Michael's hope for these steps, like mine, is partly motivated by human rights concerns, by the thought that these steps in very limited integration and openness in the North might contribute to the day in which the burdens of grave violations of human rights are substantially lightened in North Korea might. And I think that's the way forward. And it's great that with initially opposed views, we've converged uh, uh, on that. And I think that's a premise that we can try in our various ways uh, uh, to offer to people who are concerned with the human rights situation and the nuclear situation uh, uh, in North Korea. Maybe Trump will betray us, maybe he'll fail, maybe he'll do something idiotic, but I think this all points to a way forward that's available and that can and should be tried uh, uh, if not by Donald Trump, by his successor. So maybe for a change, there's some hope for the world. Jeannie Isco, your last thoughts. Well, I think uh, first we have to acknowledge how, uh, how great it has been to have Michael and Sonia here to talk about the work that they undertook and the kind of deep analysis that they've offered. I am a gender uh, theorist. So we're going to end on gender. And one of the most striking aspects of the report, the Commission of Inquiry, is the recognition of the level of gender-based violence in North Korea. Um, we haven't talked about it on this panel. We talked about it this morning. And I guess for me, a kind of failure to knit this into all of our responses to what happens next. And it's a little bit worrying to think that Trump might be the statesman to take forward gender diplomacy, I, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but also a failure to pay attention to the gender dimensions of violence permits future generations to continue this masculine mode of diplomacy, which is part of the problem, I, I would argue. And just, just one mm -hmm. thought that you know, your observation sparked. We saw, of course, in you know, Pyeongchang, the role mm -hmm. of Kim Jong-un's sister. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably facile to assume that just because of her gender, she's had any significant impact. But just looking at the photographs and looking mm -hmm. at the way in which her diplomacy was conducted, do you draw any conclusions? Uh, I mean, all it tells us is that the world of international diplomacy plays the game of gender very, very well, and in subtle and not so subtle ways. Mm -hmm. We know that, and that's why I think talking about gender is so important, and the whole kind of escalation of uh, relations previously between uh, Trump and North Korea has played a very masculine game of how, of, of responding, resp responding to each other. Um, Michael raised earlier how there are no women in the political structures in North Korea. I think that's important. Um, yeah, I don't know that we can say anything so much about the sister. Okay. Well, um, since we're out of time, all that remains for me to do is to thank the panelists. Um, and to thank the organizers. Um, I do think it is striking that we've ended on an optimistic note. I think that's really important. Um, I do think it's also important to emphasize momentum. Uh, Christopher Hill, of course, who negotiated uh, over a considerable period of time with the DPRK, liked to use the metaphor of pedaling a bicycle. And his argument was that so long as you keep moving, so long as the bicycle stays upright, you're going to head in the right direction, or at least in a direction that offers some degree of hope. Um, I think it's also quite striking that unlike the 2000 and 2007 summits that took place between North and South Korean leaders, this planned summit in April that will take place between Moon Jae-in and his North Korean counterpart is happening at the beginning of his time in office. And I think President Moon Jae-in, who's been a key player in all of this, has a number of... Um, a number of arrows in his quiver, if you like, a number of factors that work in his favor. One is that he seems, from at least personal accounts of people close to him, to be a man who doesn't judge people on the basis of hearsay or background or reporting, that he's quite effective at building personal relations. Um, 
certainly with Donald Trump and even with his Japanese counterpart. So it may be the case that the personal and the role of leadership will actually play a very important factor. But also, I think it's important to recognize the extent to which he seems to have public opinion on his side in South Korea. Somewhere in the region of 70 to 80% of the public support what he's doing. And that's really unusual in South Korean politics. So I'd like to end on that note in emphasizing the role of local actors, as well as, of course, this critical, unpredictable question about the nature of President Trump, and for that matter, his North Korean counterpart, who we know very little about. Um, but with that, I'd like to uh, thank the panel and ask you, the audience, to thank them for what I think has been a really stimulating discussion.